This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not medical care or advice. Clinicians should rely on their own medical judgments when advising their patients. Patients in need of medical care should consult their personal care provider. Welcome to That's Pediatrics, where we sit down with physicians, scientists, and experts to discuss the latest discoveries and innovations in pediatric health care. Hi, I'm Mally Williams, a pediatric hospitalist here at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And I'm Smear Agnihotri, an assistant professor in the Department of Neurological Surgery. And we are so thrilled today to have Dr. Basil Zatelli joining us for our recording today of That's Pediatrics. He has been a medical professional for over 50 years. He was here for 40 years at Children's, um, and he's a pioneer. So today when we discuss hospital medicine and the history of hospital medicine, I think it's the perfect pairing. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Um, So the first thing I was going to ask you was, as you've been here for 40 years, do you have an amusing anecdote or like a personal story from some of your clinical time here um, that's really fond for you or something that was just very amusing? I have a lot of amusing stories. Probably most of them I can't say. (laughs) Um, Uh, let, let me, there, there are, there are a lot of uh, amusing stories and, um, I think one of the, one of, I received a trophy. Okay. Um, because one of the things that I enjoyed doing with children, particularly if they've been in the hospital for a while, to try to distract them is to thumb wrestle them. Mm -hmm. And so I challenged them to thumb wrestling. And try as I may, and practice upon practice upon practice, I never win. <laughs> I never win. Um, and of course, you know the, the kids absolutely love it to pin me down because I I come in, you know, bombastically saying I'm the champ. And I'm you know I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna win easily, no problem. Sure. You know, and so forth. Right. And so, uh, within a, within a matter of a few thumb movements, they they pin my thumb, and and of course, and I you know I want a rematch mm-hmm. naturally. <laughs> and uh, the rematch is a little tougher for them, um, but they win again, and and then I demand a rematch tomorrow when I make rounds, and so this goes on, and um, finally, uh, I did do. I had I had one child who was in the intensive care unit for a prolonged period of time, and uh, thumb wrestled him frequently, and r- rarely did I win. Rarely did I win. Okay. Um, he was ultimately discharged from the hospital. He had a prolonged intubation, and I saw him back in the office and follow up. And I wanted to I wanted to see how his voice was because of the intubation. And so I asked him in the office, I, want, I said, I want you to scream. Well, he wouldn't do it. He, he just wouldn't do it. I said, so let it go for a little while. I said, okay, it's time for our match. I said, I'll make you a bet. I said, if you win, then you don't have to scream. Okay. But if I win, you have to scream. <laughs> Well, he said, that's, that's easy, you know, because he's always won, won sure. before. Well, lo and behold, I won. <gasps> oh, my. So he, he was true to form. I mean, he, he was honorable. He kept his end of the bargain. And it gave me, uh, that little episode gave me some information about his dexterity, his strength, uh, and his voice. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. So this is, you know, it's fun for me to engage in kids, with kids. Uh, most of the time it's just playful, but I, I can use it for diagnostic purposes uh, and evaluation as well. So, yeah. So that's... And that's is that I've... what you got your trophy for? The yes, one time he, you won? he gave me, he gave me a little, it almost looks like a Oscar. You know. Okay. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. Well, I think that's one of the best parts about pediatrics is the playfulness of the exam and the patients that we get to um, to help and to heal. And most of the time we, we get to watch them heal and improve, which is great. Right, right, right. I don't think we're known for thumb wrestling here. At least I haven't heard of the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh being the thumb wrestling champions. Uh, no, it's time no, to bring it back. No, I don't, I don't think we are, but um, we are known for lots of other things. So um, as a history buff yourself, we would love if you could tell us a little bit about some of the, the medical history that our hospital is known for. It's a tough question. It's a big challenge. I think I, I think that without going back to the very beginnings of the hospital, uh, I think one, of course, is our transplant program. Dr. Starzl came from Colorado in, in uh, uh, 1980, began doing adult and pediatric liver transplants here. We there were at that time there were, was only one other institution in the United States that was doing pediatric uh, liver transplants. And so uh, with that, and particularly as our success uh, improved and we were doing fairly well, we became a, a world center for not only adult, but also pediatric liver transplants. That of course went on to other kinds of transplants, just not, not liver as well. I think um, we are world renowned in our research uh, we are among a leader in NIH funding, for example. Um, and for anybody here who would attend a, a kind of a research conference, sometimes grand rounds or whatever, and listen to kind of what research projects are going on here, it is amazing. It, it's, it's almost in the realm of science fiction of what people are doing and what their what their aim is and how they're how they're doing as far as combating some of these very very difficult healthcare problems in pediatrics and so research is really a major drive cardiac surgery here is phenomenal and is well known and has one of the best overall uh, survival rates for uh, pediatric heart surgery uh, in, in the country, well, well known, well known for that as well. And, and then to become a little more personal, I th I'd like to brag a little bit sure. about uh, our pediatric hospitalist program. We, when I I I, I joined uh, Dr. Paul Gaffney, who was mm -hmm. the founder of our group. Uh, he was a pediatric hematologist oncologist by trade, but. As many uh, very well-known and, and respected pediatricians who are pediatricians, pediatricians, uh, because they see more than just their subspecialty. And Paul Gaffney was that kind of a person. And he was uh, well-respected within the entire community of Western Pennsylvania. And people would refer patients to him, not only in pediatric hematology, and oncology, but general pediatrics as well. And he would see those patients in his office, um, and he also would admit them if necessary and care for them with appropriate consultation if necessary. And so in a sense, he was a pediatric hospitalist. And that model actually had existed in many other major institutions around the country, but usually only a solo practitioner, one person. In, um, in the late 70s, 1977, uh, 78, 79, uh, several, several of us began uh, working with Dr. Gaffney. And our, as generalists, our job was to see patients referred by pedi pediatricians within the community and see them in our office uh, for outpatient evaluation, as well as admitting them to the hospital for care. It was very, very successful. Um, and pediatricians in the community were very happy to have a group of generalists who would take care of the patients and then send them back to their pediatrician rather than, rather than taking over all the care. 
So we, we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to interfere with that primary care uh, pediatrician's relationship with the family. Sure. We wanted to help the patient and the pediatrician. And it was immensely successful to the point ultimately where many of the pediatricians in the community gave up their inpatient rounding and asked our group to, to be the, the inpatient doctor uh, for, their, for their patients. So at that point in time, if you were an outpatient pediatrician, many of them also had hospital responsibilities that they would come in and see the patients that were from their practice. Is that's, cor- here. Okay. That's, that's correct. Okay. But as time went on, there were increasing demands on the private pediatrician, time demands. And for them to come in to the hospital to see one patient, mm-hmm. uh, they found was not time efficient. Sure. And so that was a motivation for them to ask our group to be the hospitalist for those patients. And so that's why our group grew mm-hmm. immensely. In our outpatient uh, pra- part of the practice, we took, we had initially, we did some primary care. We did primary care for some of the residents' families and some of the f- faculty children. But we also did primary care for the medically complex child. Mm-hmm. We're, we're part of the medical home. Okay. Uh, which we also were, was a, we served as an extension of the medical home for the primary care pediatrician providing in-hospital care. So we, uh, we were a team. And uh, so this, this was a, a model that we actually published uh, in, I believe, 1986. Um, uh, and in our research looking for this, we believe we were the first group in the United States to do this as a group rather than as a solo practitioner. And so uh, we had many different uh, institutions coming to us asking, how do you do this? How can we establish a similar similar kind of uh, program at our own hospital? And so we uh, we were a model uh, for others uh, to emulate. So we're very proud of that. Feeling a little naive as a pediatric hospitalist, I feel like I should have known all of this about right. it. So I'm so glad you're here so that I can further appreciate my job here at this institution. Um, so, my, sorry, Samir, did you have a question? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay, because um, I was just curious as someone who does this now as a large group, I'm having a really hard time envisioning how this worked for one person. Did that one person, was it more like a consult at that point in time where they came in or they were still the primary doc that was just on call all the time for these patients? Dr. Gaffney was on call all the time. Wow. Yeah, so uh, uh, in the late 70s, he wanted to slow down. Uh, he, and uh, that's when he began taking on partners. Okay. And that's that's when uh, uh, Holly Davis, who was uh, in the emergency room, uh, uh, joined the group for a period of time. Um, Tom Gessner, uh, whose son was a president of this hospital. Um, Carl Gartner, who was a chief resident in 1977, joined the group. And then in 1978, I joined the group. Uh, and then it kind of went on from there. Dr. Er- Andrew Erbach joined the group as well, I think in 1980. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, 1983 or 84. Yes. So, and, and then obviously the group has grown. As more and more patients and our responsibilities grew, we began taking on other, other kinds of responsibilities that we used to round at uh, the the Mew Family Center, and uh, um, and uh, we w- were doing that, and we did consultations. Um, we worked closely with uh, surgeons, providing consultate consultative services for any subspecialty, really. And so, out of necessity, we grew, uh, which I believe um, was great, is great. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. Um, you have such an interesting view of this place, a uh, history buff, a pioneer. Um, it's always nice to ask someone, I consider you a historian as well, of the hospital. 
where do you see the future, right? Because I think you have an interesting perspective and an interesting lens and you've seen so many programs grow. Um, what do you see for us in the next five, 10, 20 years? For, for Children's Hospital? For or? Children's Hospital and uh, medicine in general. Well, I think um, uh, Children's Hospital has a unique position, I believe, in uh, particularly Western Pennsylvania, but because our reputation and because our strengths uh, have expanded to so many different subspecialties um, that uh, we are ranked, as you know, in the top 10 programs uh, in the country. And so it is, it, it's an, an enviable position, but it's also one that is fraught with much responsibility to be able to care for patients in the best manner possible. So I think that we, have, we do have the resources to continue to do that. Uh, superb faculty, superb research capabilities, uh, and physicians to provide the care, including general pediatrics, I think with our hospitalist group, um, and, and to continue the tradition uh, of excellent care, research, uh, and, and academic work. That should continue. We should solidify our role and expand it and offer it more widely, I believe. For medicine in general, um, I think that there is challenging for medicine at this time from particularly, a, I believe, a financial point of view. Uh, there are always challenges of uh, payment that's fair for the hospital as well as fair for the patient and family. Uh, and this is a systemic uh, issue that needs to be looked at from many different facets. Uh, insurance companies uh, and, uh, you know, seem to have, they have, I believe, a narrow focus. And I think that uh, in order to care for children and family, family members, uh, we need to have a system where to get insulin, they don't have to sell their house in order, in order to get uh, medications uh, appropriately and, and access to care. Um, I can tell you that as a physician caring for medically complex children, I frequently was on the phone to insurance companies trying to get uh, authorization for, for issues, medications as well as procedures or diagnostic testing. It took a substantial amount of time and oftentimes uh, the request was refused. Mm -hmm. Extraordinarily mm -hmm. frustrating for me and more so obviously for the, for the family. Now, I know that our own administration, particularly with Dr. Erbach, uh, deals with insurance companies to try to solve the, uh, the, the conflicts. And that's an extraordinary uh, resource that this hospital has. So, uh, so I think that there are challenges in medicine uh, that I think uh, we need to try to overcome. Right. And you touched upon this very lightly, but it'd be nice to, is there any advice you could give to the future generation. There's amazing residents here, fellows, uh, medical students that we interact with daily right now. Yeah. And um, they can gain so much from your insight, but they're always looking for like, you know, uh, people like you in the past and um, how much you've contributed. And you seem like, you know, a larger than life figure. Uh, any advice you can give these guys to the next generation in terms of um, their passion, um, what to look out, career advice, something small? Well, wow, that's a broad question. Um, yeah. <laughs> before I go to there, I do. You you mentioned the residents and students. This is one of the major reasons why I came. I, I came back to Pittsburgh and came back here. I was a student here, right? Um, and uh, because I I loved working with residents, and I think our residents are the top of the tier. Uh, they're phenomenally dedicated. Just like Allie here, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and, and it is a joy, a true joy, to be able to work with the students and, and the residents. My advice to them: number one, uh, um, just in general, 
do what you love, you know, as far as your future career. Follow your bliss. I've spoken with many residents here. They struggle with decisions about, should I go into a subspecialty? Should I go into primary care? Should I be a hospitalist? Whatever. And my advice is, regardless, what do you enjoy? What do you like most? That's where you should go. That's where you will be the happiest. But I also uh, think that as caretakers, we have a responsibility to be activists as leaders in, uh, for us, for the American, in the American Academy of Pediatrics, and perhaps even in a broader sense in the community, uh, you know, schools, local community groups, um, to not only teach and to provide the care necessary, but also to help guide policy. And I think that that has been lacking, uh, that certainly was lacking in the very, very early years of my career in which physicians were relegated, not relegated so much, but we thought our job was really to take care of patients, the medical aspect of it, rather than looking at the broader picture. And I think that we, we need to have our young people look at the broad picture and become activists and leaders uh, in in policy making, both at, at every level uh, of government. We are so fortunate here to have such a strong history uh, and development of programs, and and sharing that program with the nation as well through publication and through academic work and. Um, learning how to make models sustainable for other hospitals too. One of the things you had talked about too is, you know, supporting our community and financial burdens on family. Um, UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh is working on expansion to more of our satellite communities now too, which I just think is so important because one of the biggest stresses that I see for families when they come here is they come from um, our other areas, you know, UPMC Hammett, um, Harrisburg, all other areas throughout Western Pennsylvania, even other of our states that are close to us, but not Pennsylvania. Um, and it's a financial burden. And um, I just hope that our foundation of hospital medicine here can continue to expand so we can provide care for them in hospitals. And I know that we're actively working on that here, which is just so great. I agree. Um, again, particularly in caring for children who have medically complex issues, and, partic- and particularly live in rural area, because they don't have the expertise for these complex issues, oftentimes locally, they have to rely on a medical center where the, those services are concentrated. Um, and as a result, these families oftentimes have to drive three, four, five hours, or even more in order to get the care that they need. And so you're right. Um, we, we have specialty clinics scattered around, uh, different specialty clinics. But I think, to use the term, I think Children's Hospital needs to metastasize. Uh, <laughs> That's an interesting choice of words, yeah, but I know right, what you're saying. Right, <laughs> yeah, right. I love it. Uh, <laughs> um, to provide uh, more services, hospitalist services, uh, at some, other, some of these other hospitals. So uh, I applaud the initiatives in order to do that so that our families have access. And access has been a major problem for many children. Absolutely. And so if we can improve access, we can improve care. Thank you again so much for for being here with us. We've truly appreciated learning more about the history of our hospital and the, especially for me, I mean, I guess I'm a little selfish in this, but the birth of hospital medicine here, um, which is really interesting to learn. Um, for those out uh, listening to us, whether you're your patients, your trainees, you work in the hospital, uh, you're part of UPMC Children's, if you're interested in history and you have the opportunity to visit the hospital, it's quite literally painted along the hallways, which is great. So you can start from um, square one, which we didn't go all the way back to. I think it would have been much longer than a 20 minute episode. Right. Um, but it is on the third floor by the outpatient centers. There's um, more history related to Starzl and um 
you know, liver transplant uh, related to Salk and Sabin and the polio vaccine, all of which were birthed here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. So thank you again for listening to That's Pediatrics. Thank you. Cool. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. For more information about this podcast or our guests, please visit chp.edu slash that's pediatrics. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to keep up with our new content. You can also email us at podcast.upmc at gmail.com with any feedback or ideas for topics you'd like our experts to cover on future episodes. Thank you again for listening to That's Pediatrics. Tune in next time.